It don't matter what I try I just can't win and I don't know why There's a fork in every road I pick the wrong one and then I go American loser, yes I am Disenfranchised from everything well, I fall up and I fall down An American loser the day I was born Live from a shared universe podcast studio, it is American Loser, guys. It's the podcast that put the spotlight firmly on second place. We're bringing you weird, bizarre stories from American history that you've never heard before, or maybe you did and you just want to know a little bit more. So we're here to do the deep dive, all right? My name's KP Burke. I'm a stand-up comic in New Jersey. It's starting to come back, all right? I'm only 90% construction now, 10% comedy. <laughs> Sure, I was filling in as a cameraman at Mammoth Racetrack shooting the pony races today. Yeah, but that doesn't mean I'm not still living my dreams. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that being said, we have. Uh, I'm very excited because uh, first off, it always feels good to be back in studio. We're in a shared universe where Mike and Ming are always taking great care of us. Behind the ones and twos, he tore his shirt and his own pectoral muscles today. <laughs> Cahoons, how you feeling, buddy? I'm good, man. I'm better. I'm with you guys, so it's all. It's automatically uh, a good he, day. He's oh, just throwing. Oh, he's go. softening us See up. That? And, uh, of course, you guys also know that other voice, uh, the, the melodic tones uh, of my father's voice, my dilf of a dad, Larry Burke. Say hello to everyone, will you? Hey, what's going on, everybody? Happy, uh, well, not happy Memorial Day. Yeah, you changed your tone Memorial halfway Day. through that one, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, we had absolutely have to. To say happy Memorial Day is really a, a disservice, It's a, but a remembrance of Memorial Day. But here we are, anyhow, at the Shared Universe Studio, and where other than? Eatontown, New Jersey. The center of the universe, New Jersey. Uh, also back in New Jersey because everything just feels right. Okay. It just pulls you back. <laughs> Mercury's in retrograde. Force. Guess who's back from LA? Full time now, back in the great state of New Jersey. One of my favorite comics, one of my great buddies, Max Antonucci. Welcome back, buddy. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, it's not often that I have the second best mustache in the room, but now that <laughs> Larry Burke's here, uh, I'm feeling a bit intimidated, but I'm happy to be here. And I get to finally meet Kahuna because I love this show. So it's uh, well, you're also one of our uh, more popular guests too, Max. For those who uh, loser devotees will remember him from the uh, Jaws, the 1916 uh, shark uh, attacks. Yes, the Jersey shark attacks. Yeah, specifically. Yeah, we inspired oh. Jaws, guys. It is what it is. <laughs> um, is it? This one also actually has a movie made after it today that we're about to cover, and I'm excited because usually at the end we like to throw over to Kahuna for a casting couch. There already technically has been one which is pretty good. So I want to see what your uh, your reboot version would be for this. Okay. So I'm excited about that one. But uh, And real quickly, too, uh, Max, just plug up front. Where, where can people find you? You're back in Jersey City. He's available for shows, and you can sling some hog, ladies. You let him know. <laughs> That's right. Need? That's right. Any slam pigs in New York, come over my way. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I You could follow me at Max Antonucci on Instagram, Twitter. I don't use Twitter. And then my uh, website, maxisyourfriend.com. Go over there, subscribe, whatever you got to do. And he's being very humble, but you know what? Uh, our buddy did get some jokes on a, a certain Comedy Central roast not too long ago, <laughs> too. So uh, funny motherfucker, check him out, oh, will you? Thank you. Thank you, KP. I got to say thank you real quick, too. An apology, first and foremost, to uh, the Shining Wizards Wrestling Podcast. I did not realize that our show was being put on their network and that I was supposed to help promote that and do other stuff to it. I don't know how that stuff works. So I think we got taken off their network, and I think I got unfriended by one or two of them. But we patched everything up. I spoke to them all. So I want to say thank you to any of our listeners that came over from the, the Shining Wizards Network. And I'll also thank you to uh, Matt, Tony, uh, and the infamous Kevin Garifo over in Shining Wizard Wrestling Podcast. <laughs> and, of course, one of their great fans, one of uh, a guy who really has been just nothing but supportive of this show. I really love the shit out of him. Uh, Handsome Dan Lopez. He's got a show called Dan's Final Say. Please check him out. Uh, he promotes every week on here on uh, on his own page about our show. So we just want to do that in return. Uh, Handsome Dan, he's uh, got the final say. He's a big personality, too, man. You, there's a reason why he's a pro wrestling fan. I'll put it that way, all right? <laughs> but... I think we got all of our house cleaning out of the way here, so I'm ready to roll if you guys are. Oh, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm full go. of I'm excited for this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard not to be because uh, it's a good one. So uh, I know Ming knew the answer to this earlier. Um, and this, by the way, is one of the free episodes here too. So uh, and we'll enjoy that one if you're a new listener on this one. Um, but uh, Kahuna, in 2030, what do you think you're going to be doing? 2030? Yeah. 
Eh, hopefully retired. He's chilling <laughs> on the beach, not dead. <laughs> Kahuna, the youngest man in the room, says, it'll take me about nine years to retire. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well, that good, guys. Come on. <laughs> he is good. Let's be fair, folks. Um, but in 2030, something interesting is going to happen. Uh, an active warrant from the United States Marshal Service will finally expire. Okay, so nine years from now, from this moment, we're recording this, that warrant is still active. Okay, and the men named in this warrant will be at least 100 years old by that time. But in order to quote the head of the U.S. Marshal Services, the Marshal Services, they don't give up looking for people. So <laughs> they might still be looking for these men at large. But in 1979, uh, another law enforcement agency, the FBI, finally closed its investigation into events that took place in 1962. Uh, oh, I was getting excited. What do you got, buddy? Is, does this have to do with Alcatraz? It sure does. Yeah! <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the only people to ever escape. Uh, and he's Quote using unquote. the quotes appropriately. Appropriately. Now, Max, what did you know about this story before? Because obviously Cahoons knows a little bit. Uh, before it, I didn't know much. I knew they made a movie. Uh, I knew that it was always deemed the inescapable prison, the only inescapable prison, and they sent the worst people there. And uh, Sean Connery. Yeah, that's true. And I didn't know much of the story, but I had kind of glossed over a little bit because I'm huge on conspiracies, and there's a lot uh, of conspiracies lot of it, with buddy. this one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've always kind of circled back to it, but when it comes to things like this, like people uh, kind of disappearing without a trace, the D.B. Cooper one is always mm -hmm. what I wind up going back to. So <laughs> no matter what I find, they're always mentioned in the same article. I just circle back there. Yeah, don't uh, don't ever search a Guatemalan Civil War if you don't have two hours and uh, don't want to sleep <laughs> at night. Uh, but uh, the FBI in 1979 will conclude their investigation of events that took place in 1962. And at the time, their conclusion was the three men must have drowned in San Francisco Bay and their bodies were unfortunately never recovered. Never recovered. Never recovered. <laughs> right. The men being sought after in this warrant are the Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, respectively, and their absolutely fascinating friend. And I would say this this he's gonna get the uh the the large portion of the losering today, if you will. Uh Mr. Frank Morris. Now Frank had been abandoned by his parents at age eleven and was convicted of his first crime by age 13. Yeah, he was a, he was a quick he was a quick study for yeah. sure. What was I getting into around age 13, dad? <laughs> Other than my own pants. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> well, Morris spent his youth in uh, foster homes and institutions and he uh, put together a nice little rap sheet that included uh, narcotics arrests, uh, grand larceny and a little armed robbery too. And uh, Just Morris a bit. Yeah, Morris is very unique though. Um, did you <laughs> trouble you? He was a well, a troubled youth, but I mean, there, there's usually a thing that they always say about um, uh, excitable boy, man. Excitable, <laughs> <laughs> not the first or last Zevon reference to be made on this yeah. show. Um, but there's some interest. Did you uh, come up with this weird little factoid about Frank Morris? Because this one is the greatest Snapple fact I've ever read. Just if you know it, I want you to say it. If not, no. Problem. I don't think I know it. Um, he ranked in the top two percent. Uh, intelligence wise, when they did an IQ test on him, he has an IQ score of 133, which would be considered qualifying for Mensa and uh, certainly puts him within the top 2% of uh, the prison population. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They even wrote yeah. superior intelligence on his uh, his prison forms, if you will, like his, uh, the, his little dossier that they had for him. So you knew that you were dealing with a guy, not necessarily a Hannibal Lecter type. There's nothing evil about him per se, but you are dealing with a guy that's going to figure out, well, there's a weakness here. And if these guards are making $15 an hour and they didn't go to college and I'm superior intelligence. I think I'm going to figure out a way to get away from you guys. <laughs> For sure. And that's got to be, you know, silver lining. You're going to prison, but they think so highly of you to say you have superior <laughs> intelligence. And it's got to feel... Thank you for the compliment. It's got to soften the blow a little bit you know, that you're I doing uh, time. <laughs> I wasn't most likely to succeed at Louisiana State Penitentiary. <laughs> yeah. But no, perfect point. Um, now, having been incarcerated for a large portion of his young life, Frank Morris's IQ has never developed in any sort of a respectable outcome. So I feel like if he if he didn't go to jail, he just would have been doing stand up because that's what happens yeah, with high IQ people. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he did uh, use this intelligence in order to escape from the aforementioned Louisiana State Penitentiary, where uh, despite his impressive IQ, uh, Morris would then get caught committing a burglary just a year later. So he springs himself out of jail, 
it's that um, Holding together too smart right for his in. own good kind of a thing. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> he gets arrested again, and now this time, because he already pulled off the escape. Just not... when I got out, they put me right back in. <laughs> it's the truth, man. It's the truth. And what are they going to do here now? That the... You can't just go back and send this guy already escaped from Louisiana State Penitentiary to a laid-back jailhouse. You're going to the Rock this time. All right, that's Alcatraz. So I'm going to set up two more things here, and then we're going to answer the question in everybody's mind. What the fuck is Alcatraz? <laughs> so... Now, the Anglin brothers, they're the other two guys here uh, that are interesting characters in their own right. They are reportedly nonviolent, occasional criminals that only resorted to crime when they were unable to find work, which seems like it was all the time. Uh, they had grown up in a very, very large family, tons of brothers and sisters. and uh, But these two, uh, John and Clarence, were uh, considered inseparable. And so eventually it just kind of makes sense that these two would have a cell next to one another on the rock. Yeah. AKA right. Alcatraz. Right. It was the uh, the Anglican brother uh, neighborhood kind of a thing, you know? Yeah, it's like the block. Like Uncle Marty always, I'm sorry, Uncle Marty, Grandpa Marty talked about uh, going to uh, fight in World War II with all the other kids from West New York. He's like, just like, you know, different uniforms, you know, but you're all hanging out with the same people. <laughs> same gang. Yeah. <laughs> same gang of guys. And the uh, final prisoner, before I throw over to you, handsome, is uh, uh, involved directly with this infamous escape, escape, is a guy by the name of Alan West. No, not that one. Not the <laughs> not the politician you're thinking of. Um, this one's from New York City and is a career criminal with over 20 arrests and one escaped attempt under his belt as well. And this time, after you try to bust out of prison and you fail, where are they going to send you, Cahoons? Alcatraz. The Rock, baby. All right. Now, Dad, real quick, just for the listeners at home, what the fuck is Alcatraz? Uh, Alcatraz. Real quick, well, Alcatraz is an island in San Francisco Bay that... Uh, Originally, uh, you know, the even the, the Native Americans who were in that area long before the Europeans arrived, uh, it, it was noted as being like evil spirits kind of a thing that they would even send their own uh, tribal uh, people that weren't quite following the rules of the tribe. They would send them out there to uh, in isolation kind of a thing. So, you know, there's a whole, Jesus. you know, a natural bad, prison. Yeah, bad juju going on with that island just to begin with. And Alcatraz itself um, was a, a Spanish um, discovery, if you will, if you want to call it that. I mean, it was Native Americans already there, but um, Alcatraz is really uh, uh, an anglicized version. Of, in Spanish, it means the island of the pelicans. So <laughs> that's where the, the Alcatraz kind of a thing comes from um and then uh it's got a very interesting history that um you know the spanish are there in in california in the san francisco area and then uh with the whole united states going through that whole manifest destiny kind of a thing with um uh, tyler and, and president polk and everything else uh they pick a fight with the spanish government and it, that turns into being the uh, mexican-american war um, and then there's a, which on paper America won, but if you really look at it, I think we lost. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so now we're in the, uh, 1840s kind of a thing that, uh, uh, the Spanish own San Francisco, the United States picks a fight with the Mexican, well, the Spanish, I should say the Mexicans own the California. Uh, the United States picks a fight with Mexico. It leads to the Mexican-American War. Uh, President Polk sends a guy by the name of John C. Fremont. You yeah. might have you might have heard of him. He was uh, he was a big hero for the California kind of thing. But he's secretly sent out to California with the instructions of, "Hey, uh, cause an insurrection out there in California. Let's see if we can get something going here with uh, with this Mexican War." But don't don't have it attributed to the United States. Just have the locals get a little indignant with the uh, with the local authorities. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, um, with the Mexican War, um, uh, Fremont uh, is given the title of uh, the military governor of California. Um, he, I'm sorry, the governor. The governor. Just making sure. <laughs> Just making sure. The governor, exactly. Um, but. Uh, Fremont actually buys the island and uh, in the name of the United States government. Um, and the idea was that they're going to establish a military base there because with a military base on that island, they can now can 
troll San Francisco. And San Francisco is is a major or one of the major places along the California coast. And what's so going to happen? The two troll- big islands, because you have Ellis Island here in the New York Harbor that you have to defend, which um, you defend all Manhattan to with Sandy Hook. So that's the same thing where we'd have, you know, what was it? Uh, Fort Ham- No, not Hamilton. Yeah, Fort Hamilton's also, that's part of uh, right. Wadsworth yeah. and, and Hamilton are uh, protecting the, the New York uh, Harbor, but same kind of a thing on the on the West Coast. And actually, that becomes a major uh, fortification, if you will, on the entire West Coast, on the on the entire Pacific Coast. 1850, the Mexican uh, American War is over. 1850, uh, President uh, Fillmore. Uh, orders that Alcatraz Island be set up as a military inst- inst- uh, installation. Uh, and that's key, too, because what happened in 1848, lose reception <laughs> with the uh, Emperor Norton and uh, the whole California gold rush. San Francisco becomes a key player with that whole thing, because, again, it's one of the few ports that they can have uh, ships arrive. If you guys don't know about the Emperor Norton episode, you got to go check him out. He's an all time favorite. So continue <laughs> yeah. here, sir, because we got some new listeners that are coming it's, in. So I want to put a smile on Kahuna's face oh, just yeah. thinking about He was essentially a homeless <laughs> madman that was that declared himself emperor of uh, San Francisco. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's quite amazing. The dream. <laughs> so they start fortifying uh, the island uh, to protect uh, San Francisco uh, Harbor, if you will. Uh, again, this is uh, the 1850s, um, and what's going to happen shortly after that is things are starting to heat up now with uh, um, the whole slavery issue and the Confederates and the Northerners. Well, the, the American Civil War breaks out, uh, and they uh, now fortify the island with like a whole mess of cannons and everything else because they were f- afraid that the Confederates were going to try to capture san francisco and they had just discovered gold there so that's a pretty important state uh matter of fact california in itself was originally thought that they were going to split it in half that the northern half was going to be free and the, and the southern half was going to be Baha uh, and Alta, so, california yeah yeah so um you know things were um pretty diverse if you will with viewpoints in california at the time the big thing too was uh there was also the uh, emphasis to build a lighthouse on the island, and that is one of the oldest lighthouses on the uh, on the Pacific coast that still exists there today, to again to pre- help guide ships into uh, San Francisco. Um, the uh, the island or the military fortification then starts to take on a whole different attitude too, because now they're starting to send um, military prisoners there. Um, you know, guys that screwed up in the army or the navy, uh, they start sending um, <laughs> military bad people <laughs> to Alcatraz. Um, they, they set up a, a prison installation. And while the, some of the prisoners are there, they have them as part of their uh, work program to start constructing um, prison facilities, cells on, on the island. That whole thing takes on a whole uh, different kind of an attitude now because now we're, we're moving into the, uh, the next century, if you will. Um, you know, now eight, the Civil War is over. Uh, actually, during the Civil War, they held Confederate prisoners there. They uh, also always an angle. <laughs> yeah, they, they also um, um, people who were uh, charged with treason. In other words, Confederate sympathizers. They also threw them in into uh, Alcatraz into the military uh, prison facility. A real well of souls. After yeah. That, so there was some, there was some. Very, uh, very bad people that were being held on that. Um, you now you fast forward um, through uh, Reconstruction, and now we're up to the Spanish-American War, and Alcatraz takes on a whole new um, kind of a attitude again because the old fortifications are now outdated. Now we're fighting a whole new, you know, quote unquote, modern war. Um, a lot of the people that were um, a lot of the military personnel that were returning from um, the Spanish-American War with the fight in the Philippines uh, are now being incarcerated into Alcatraz. Again, it's still a military prison. Um, 
it's then right around the turn of the century in 1909, they start to construct this huge concrete main cell block. That's the most predominant thing that still remains on the island today. So when you go see a tour of it, this is what you're seeing. So yeah, and, and it's 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 right now today it's a it's a major tourist attraction um, um, for San Francisco. It's very cool. Been there. That's uh, that's that's definitely a, a, a great trip to uh, take take on. Um, but this uh, three-story um, um, cell block is now uh, built right at the Cones turn of the century. a picture up on the screen for us here, too. There Keep you going, go. Sir. All right. Um, now, the original um, fortification was known as the Citadel, which was a, a three-story barracks. That's torn down, and now they start to build this main cell block. But the... Uh, there was always the fear that below all of that, down in the dungeons of the of the of the cell block, is some of the remains of the original fortifications, and that became known as the dungeons. Whether that was there or not, and all kinds of tunnels, and you know, it's a whole big, uh, you know, mystery. Uh, there was a documentary history. about this. Yeah, yeah that uh, it was. Uh, you got to see some of the the inner workings of what the old prison was and stuff like that it was starring Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. It's called The Rock. <laughs> the Rock. There you go. Possibly the greatest action movie ever made. I mean, going. can you imagine being on a boat and you're going to Alcatraz and you're just looking at like the beautiful water and then you turn around and you just see this grim looking building and you know you're going there for 15, <laughs> 20 years. Right. And I'm assuming that it always looked dirty and broken down from the time too, it yeah. was built. Yeah. I yeah. feel like it's just always had that appearance. Absolutely. It is an intimidating looking island for sure. That's And that's one of the reasons why it was turned into a military prison because once it became obsolete for the military, it's still a great place to put people that you don't want to see for a while because just by the the tides, the currents, the temperature of the water and everything else surrounding the island, that there's, you know, there's pretty slim chance that you're going to be able to escape off of that island. Well, they would also feed into that. So as you did a great job, and I don't mean to cut you off, you have more. I got a little bit more. It, keep going. Though, right. so I'll tell you, what, <laughs> as you're doing that, I'll, I'll say this one part too real quick, though. Uh, so the island already has this reputation. And as Max said, it's a fucking intimidating looking place. Uh, the Native Americans gave it the bad juju back in the day. And that's before any structures are up there. Right. Now we're adding intimidating looking structures. You really got to see this thing to truly appreciate it, which is why we're giving it to you through the magic of audio. Um, however, that being said, uh, if you really did take a look at it, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. And since the thing has a reputation here, too, what they used to do is the same way we always say it on the show here. You don't have to correct someone when they assume something wrongly that's an advantage to you. So. Uh, like a lot of people think that I'm friends with Colin Quinn because there's one good picture of me and him. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to correct you, but yeah. the same way that the uh, with the people on you know, when the prison came into uh, uh, fruition, if you will, they would say that all the guards on Alcatraz are crack like crack shots, absolute perfect sharpshooters. There's no way anybody's ever you know going to get away from them. Meanwhile, in reality, some of these guards never fired a gun before. The other thing they would say is that, oh, well, uh, out in the bay there, uh, if anyone ever got into the water, there's so many great white sharks in the San Francisco Bay that you would just be eaten if you tried to swim away. Not only are there not currently, but there never have been great white sharks <laughs> yeah. in San Francisco Bay. But again, you can just sit there and be like, oh, is, hey, is that true? No, you don't have to correct them if it's like, oh, well, I'm not going to tell the prisoner. Oh, no, no, it's actually really easy to get out of here because right. it's not easy to get out of here. I think there's like uh, there's something like 36 attempts. No, 18 attempts, 36 people in total, I believe what it was, that eventually try to escape. And these guys we're talking about today are the only ones where they don't have any firm conclusion as to how it all went down. So, LP, not to interrupt you, what do you got? Well, so now we're up to like the turn of the century. And then during World War One, the prison now starts to hold uh, conscientious objectors and some of these, uh, um, um, ter not terrorists, but uh, the uh, the guys that were looking to blow up the... Um, that's the word I'm looking for. Oh, crap. <laughs> Domestic terrorists? Yeah, well. Anarchists? Anarchists. Anarchists. Thank hey, you. Thank there you. We there go. we go. Anarchists. Uh, a very famous one uh, was the guy that actually wrote this little book about his experiences on thing, and he called it Uncle Sam's Devil's Island, which was <laughs> like, you know, that's uh, that's Devil's Island was the, the French uh, penitentiary. But anyhow, finally now the uh, – 
the military disciplinary barracks on Alcatraz is acquired by the United States Department of Justice. Finally. On, <laughs> finally, on October 12th, 1933. And this is where it really starts getting, you know, the whole reputation is, is boosted, <laughs> elevated. Um, who do we have in charge of the FBI at that point? J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover. Loser so he section. wanted a place. He wanted a federal penitentiary that was going to be inescapable and could be held up as, you know, the uh, the watchtower to uh, um, all these other penitentiaries that you screw up someplace else, you fuck up someplace else, we're going to send you to Alcatraz because that is inescapable. Yeah, penitentiaries are like podcasts too. You want to there. get uh, some good guests, a couple of big names, bolster <laughs> right, reputation. Right. And, uh, the, and again now, we're in 1933, and what's going on in 1933 is, um, you know, prohibition and gangling murders, Al Capone, uh, the machine, all the uh, machine gunning, uh, gangland slayings and everything else. So the people are kind of demanding, hey, we got to do something about this whole uh, rise in crime kind of a thing. They're, they're shooting up our streets. So we just got to lock these people away, uh, at least have a place to lock these people away. So. Uh, as I said, 1933, or the federal prison in, in uh, 1934, Alcatraz is designed to hold prisoners who continuously cause trouble in other federal prisons. So the baddest of the bad, the real rotten eggs out of the whole bunch are going to be put away in, uh, in Alcatraz. And uh, the first warden is a guy by the name of James A. Johnston, and he's got a little history himself. He he Jimmy had, Johnson, yeah, two Super Bowls with the Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Johnson, right. Well, he also had some experience at Folsom and at San Quentin, some of the more notorious uh, so prisons. Johnny to begin Cash with. is very familiar with <laughs> right, this guy's right. work. Right. You can hear the train are coming. But uh, <laughs> uh, he is noted as not being a real sweetheart of a guy. He's He was kind of, a, the quote that I found, an Iron Man. And he puts down. Um, some uh, rules and regulations for Alcatraz that were, you know, horrendous, if you will. Um, part of which one of the, some of the former prisoners said one of the things was the silence that they had to march from one place to the other in complete silence uh, under, you know, pretty severe restrictions and stuff. But this is a, a premier facility. And again, you're on an island uh, to escape the island is, is pretty remote. Um, some of the um, original um, inmates are guys like Al Capone. Uh, now, Al Capone, for those of you who don't know, was in the mafia that J. Edgar Hoover said doesn't exist about 10 years prior to this. <laughs> right. So right. keep going. Um, well, Al Capone is sent there because um, Al Capone's influence in the Atlanta prison that he was in, he was just buying favors. Uh, he was, you know, bribing bribing the guards and that kind of stuff so there's um, a picture online uh of what his room actually looked like and it's lavish it's, it's in, a, in the atlanta it, prison it, yeah. yeah we might have pulled that up on this very show i think an eastern state penitentiary that's the one we looked at that yeah, was it he yeah has, he had like a really like a beautiful I'm, rug uh, yeah like he had <laughs> one of those things he had a nice radio like the, what's a phone thing the oh, radio uh, that has the cone coming out of it. I know, oh, uh, a phonograph or something? Phonograph, yeah, phonograph. There you go, yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine he was listening to anything good. Yeah. No, it's... Uh... Well, the cells in Alcatraz, the cells in Alcatraz are four and a half feet wide by 10 feet long. So that's that's your... You got a broom closet. That's your room. <laughs> that's As your Max spot. said, uh, 1800 bucks a month in Jersey City. <laughs> yes, in Jersey City. That's what it is. 1800 a month. Not including utilities. That's it. <laughs> But uh, Al Capone, uh, Robert Franklin Stroud, who became known as the Birdman of Alcatraz, George Machine Gun Kelly, Bumpy Johnson, uh, uh, Raphael Miranda. Um, there's there were some really bad boys uh, that were involved with that. Um, Arthur Dark Barker of the uh, Barker oh, Doc gang. Barker, Ma Barker's okay, gang. So yeah, there's a loser reception. And Alvin Creepy Carpus. Who served more time at Alcatraz than any other inmate? So that's Shit, that's the title. Name. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy Carpus uh, sounds like he could be a comedian for yeah. sure. He was we uh, I forget which what gang he was running with that we wound up covering him a little bit. But you saw a picture of him and it it fit. It was definitely the Christian Cordes gang. 
That's a... <laughs> Uh, those, those, they, they liked puppets way too much. It was fucking weird. The inside <laughs> baseball listeners appreciate what we're doing there. Yeah. <laughs> now, we do got to get up eventually towards the escape itself, though, Dad. Yeah, well, else? So, I mean, this this original warden was only there for the first uh, 12 years or so. But the conditions that he <laughs> laid out were pretty much followed throughout the history of Alcatraz. And Alcatraz was in operation as a federal uh, penitentiary for 29 years. So, um but we had some other famous guests, which leads us into today's loser topic. Well, we set uh, the, for those listening at home, our little recap now is we're about to get into the escape itself. You have Frank Morris, then you have the Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, and then you have a guy by the name of Alan West. So that's your four primo. To, now, when Kahuna kind of set it up front, too, but three people is who they're looking for still, right? Yeah. So I just mentioned four. So something weird's about to go down. <laughs> so... Um, now, with Morris as an escape artist with superior intelligence, uh, it would make sense that after springing himself from Louisiana State Penitentiary, that he would be sent to Alcatraz. So he had served time in other facilities with the Anglin brothers and struck up a friendship with West and a couple, you know, a couple other inmates while he was there. So it's um, for the ability to not be able to speak and maybe having hard labor and stuff like that. It is kind of this weird prisoner's code thing, because a couple of the documentaries I watched, I don't know if it came up in the one you were watching, Max, but uh, they have other prisoners or inmates at Alcatraz who knew these guys and were like, of course we're all rooting for them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> one team, one fight. We're <laughs> <laughs> inmates right. united. But uh, it's a goofy thing to, to try to process though. But uh, the Alcatraz inmates are so notoriously loyal to one another that when it comes to matters of them versus the guards of the establishment, uh, they're going to do whatever they can to make sure that uh, you know the other inmates have a fair chance here because that is the one thing they have in common, baby. They're all in here together. They're yeah. all dreamers. That's, that's right. <laughs> With high ambitions. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're all innocent. Did you know that? Well, this escape move is a thing of legitimate yeah. genius here. Uh, Frank and the others slowly plan their escape by showing patience and resolve rather than the sort of a mad dash feeling. So uh, by working the various jobs available to them at the prison, the men put together some makeshift digging tools and other supplies from the mess hall the prison workshop and sort of making deals with other prisoners to get their hands on some stuff. Did you get into what they started digging out their walls with? Yeah. So they started digging out their walls with spoons, um, saw blades that were discarded. And then there was a drill that they were using. I forget what they were using, like a vacuum yep. battery. <laughs> a vacuum cleaner motor. Yeah. Which yeah, yeah. is insane because you're <laughs> right. like, man, these guys would succeed so well if they just weren't criminals, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's, right. that's genius for 1960, I guess, or maybe I'm thinking 1930s still. But it's super impressive. Without a doubt, man. But you also have to factor in that the facilities were in terrible condition. So it wasn't like, I mean, you they were able to do it with spoons part of the time. So, you know, it was already Imagine, crumbling. Yeah, I met because there's um, a fort down in uh, St. Augustine, Florida, uh, La, Costillos, La Costillos de San Marcos, that is uh, made out of uh, crushed uh, shells, like, like, like seashells. <laughs> And it's actually, they said it was uh, tough enough that it could bounce a cannonball off of it. Wow. That's how, how compound they made that or whatever you want to say. Um, but the idea that if you just, if you have the time. That's right. All right you have got a little bit of time. time. Yeah, all you got is time. And man. you got a, a dirty spoon from the mess hall and maybe an old saw blade. You can dig your way through the impenetrable walls of Alcatraz. It's not a great, you know. It's not a ringing endorsement for uh, what a badass prison this thing's been made out to be. It's right. entire life up to this right. point. Plus the fact that um, the thing was designed so that one man, one cell, there wasn't, you weren't doubled up or tripled up or anything. So it's one, so the isolation. Now, if I go to prison, there. I want that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very important to me. <laughs> right. Well, that's a different uh, attitude with the, <laughs> the prison population nowadays. Uh, yeah. That's, I'll be your girlfriend. No one was getting their cheeks clapped at Alcatraz. <laughs> <Cheeks>. <laughs> Sorry, I spent the last year in lockdown Googling what to do if you go to prison. I've just been watching those videos. Uh, it's, you got to be prepared. You never know. I'm afraid of being wrongfully accused of something. Right. It's always been my biggest fear, even since I was a child. You don't want to let that research go to the last minute. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the word, you better do the research now because uh, I've had friends that try to give me advice about what to do in prison, but uh, they've never been to prison either. So yeah. they, don't, they don't know. This is just advice they have in theory they would work and my one buddy goes 
what you do the first day of prison is you walk up to the biggest, baddest motherfucker in that place, and then you start sucking his dick. You're a bitch now. That's a, <laughs> so. You just willingly do it. That's how you assert the dominance. Is you say, hey, I'm sucking your dick tonight. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not something they read in Popular Mechanics. Um, no. Now, what's crazy is that the, uh, Popular Mechanics is uh, a magazine that Frank Morris and the boys are taking ideas from. So I don't know if it was because of the the vacuum, uh, the, the vacuum powered motor, if you will, uh, uh, drill that they created. Uh, but there's also some other stuff in it. Sports Illustrated comes in. If you want to talk about dangerous reading, this isn't exactly the anarchist cookbook here, but they're coming up with some weird ways to apply some stuff they're learning from the magic of reading. And, yeah, uh, from the from the prison library that uh, they had a lot of different periodicals and uh, books and everything. And that was one of the things that Alcatraz was noted for is that um, from the original warden that this guy, you know, supplied the prison library. And Alcatraz was also noted as having really good food, as opposed to a lot of the slop that some of the other <laughs> federal prisons were giving you. And they, Food, this, ocean this, views, <laughs> time to read. That's right. Finally, kick your feet well, up at Alcatraz. When you say ocean views, too, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, Max, that that was one of the things that was like tormenting a lot of these prison population For sure, guys. Yeah. They could look out their, their out the window and see San Francisco just across the water with everybody coming and going and everything else. And here they are stuck on this godforsaken rock. Yeah, if you're going to Alcatraz, be sure to wear flowers in your hair, you know? It's, just, it's a beautiful place. In the springtime, absolutely. Well, one of the biggest torture moments for us would be uh, on board the ship that I was on back in the day, back with us Carney. What they would do is sometimes we'd pull just far enough uh, away from the shore that we were just at a cell phone uh, service, but you could literally see the lights of Jack's Beach bars and just like, people over there having a good time. We're just floating oh. here in this tin can. <laughs> So you can see why you would go nuts over a period of time with that. But we do got to ask this one. If they're digging, and because what they started doing is that they realized that there was these little air vents, uh, uh, vents in their cell. And that Morris started digging away at the side of his with these, again, rusty spoons, or old spoons, I should say, and you saw blades. But it doesn't matter that you're able to get away at it for a while with the concrete. I mean, it's pretty impressive, but you're also going to make some noise, man. So what are you going to do to cover up this noise? Cooney, you want to take one wild guess what they did to cover up the noise? Started fights? That's interesting, but that wouldn't give you the guaranteed time that you needed. Uh, so You'd another have to start a fight every night. <laughs> <laughs> this was pretty great. Uh, Alcatraz, again, a very progressive prison. Um, they got good food. They're letting you read a lot. And then also there's a music hour. That after dinner, all the musicians in the prison were allowed to uh, sit down and play their instruments. Now, unfortunately, you know that the old joke about, uh, I swear to God, I'm not making this up. <laughs> you know the old joke about uh, when you walk into an apartment building and you get to smell what everybody's been cooking all at the same time and it winds up smelling, it's probably great as an individual thing, but it smells terrible as a whole. That's kind of what it was like when every musician was playing an instrument at the same time. <laughs> right. And playing something prison. different. Right? They're all playing a different tune. They're right. all working. And um, oh my God. Frank Morris played the accordion. All right. So he would play the accordion and then they would sit there and they would, uh, you know, use it. The... <laughs> I'm escaping. Play it again, Frank. Play it again. <laughs> you don't know, but I'm plotting my grand escape from Alcatraz. Fuck you all. I'm sure some of the inmates were like, I just wish I was hearing the screams of someone getting their cheeks clapped as opposed to this. I guess I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Uh, oh this is God. the word I'm about to use is uh, I want to say I'm getting it right is a cacophony of yes. sound right so it's a big big mixture of all sorts of crazy sounds come through at once and <laughs> you know what combine that with a little bit of uh, accordion music and all of a sudden it's at least loud enough that you can be digging in a concrete wall here but what happens when they get past the concrete wall all right because now they, they got through their little air vent they dug it up just wide enough that a man could slide through all right uh, so what they have to do they have to replace that vent now right if they're behind the wall did you figure out how they did that one? Yeah. This this drove me nuts. I couldn't believe that this worked. This is too simple. <laughs> but, uh, they they molded out a cardboard. It was cardboard, yep. right? Yes, a cardboard vent so that it looked exactly like the steel plate that was that was the previous that was vent. There, right? Yeah. 
and they painted it to masters. They literally did. Yeah, they painted it. It's like kind of like when you see the uh, in cartoons where they paint the road into the wall. And it <laughs> right. it was had the exactly road runner like there. That. Yes. <laughs> it was oh perfect. But they did. They borrowed art supplies so they could match the paint color and everything like that. I mean, you can really see it's on full display that Morris was a genius. So. Uh, now, if they're through there, though, and they're going to be, they find a way, they work their way up into the air shafts, and they're trying to figure out, looking for weak spots and how they can try to possibly escape. But here's the other problem. While they're behind there in this makeshift workshop, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do here next. Um, they got to figure out what's going to happen when the guards come by at night to do count. So hard count would be during the day where they say, all right, count, get out of your cell. And then they do a count inventory of all the inmates, make sure everybody's there. Yeah. They had a hard count many times during the day. That was one some of the, the most with yeah. Alcatraz. That, uh, it was like 12 times a day. They're doing it. They're doing the head count. Well, now at night, what they would, they would just see your head, you know, in the bed and just move on and go from there. So what do they do in order to uh, create the illusion that someone's in bed? No. Yes. Way. Yep. Kahuna already knows. We've it, Max was on point with some cartoon it's shit, man. Time, <laughs> it's puppet time. It's puppet time. This is the puppet best time. episode ever. <laughs> Life size puppet. <laughs> yeah, I swear just, to God. And just like just occasionally like make it move with a foot or something, or just oh my god, I love this story. Uh, it'd be great if it was an Elmo puppet in bed. It's a <laughs> Frank Morris and Mate One Seven Seven. The muppet. Escape from Alcatraz. Coming 2022. <laughs> right. It could be done, man. But uh, it's wild. What they do is that uh, they actually have one of the guys that's working. One of the Anglin brothers is working in the prison barber shop, and so uh, a guy would go get his hair cut, and then at the end of the shift, he would just fill his pockets with human hair, and they would then use the human hair to make it really look authentic, as they would slowly glue that on. One of the interviews I read about, uh, was uh, listening to, I should say. Uh, was saying that what you could do is with a little bit of the concrete dust, maybe a little bit of glue and a little bit of paint, you could put together like some sort of an epoxy that now is sticking this human hair right. onto this mask that you're making. The masks are still preserved. They're being kept in Alcatraz, I believe. I don't know if it's part of a tour, if you have to have some sort of special access to see it, but Cahoons can pull them up. They don't look like they should be faking grown men out, but it worked with the dark lights and everything over there. Yeah, it was, it's at night. It was, <laughs> they put, he found them. <laughs> These look amazing. Yeah, it looks like Swayze's mask from Point Break. Yeah, um, but they were using concrete oh, dust yeah. from their digging. They were using like soap and toothpaste and uh, some wow. other stuff to have like a, a glue to mold that whole thing together. And they were gluing the hair from the barbershop I mean, on there and what? stuffing pillows and bl extra blankets and that type of stuff under the covers. So it was just a head resting on the pillow that it appeared Honestly, as if... The like, body was still they, there. They're good from afar. They are pretty But can good you good. imagine, like, getting up close to it and the realization? I mean, I've woken up next to women after a night of drinking <laughs> and been terrified in the morning. Can Closing you imagine time. going in and seeing that and turning them around and seeing that face and that nose? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, one, the one mask, the nose was broken off because when the guard came around to do the head count and he was trying to rouse the guy out, he... He reached into the cell and, and pushed on the on the cot, and the head rolled off the cot, and, and the nose was broken when it hit the oh, floor. God. That's that's why that that's nose is still broken. Yeah, right. <laughs> you broke my nose, man. But wait a second here, uh, LP. If um, these guys are going to figure out how to get behind the wall, they're going to be over here in the air shafts now. I mean, if the guards aren't going to discover the hole in the wall, and they're not going to notice them having uh, you know, the the at least created the illusion that they're asleep in their beds here still, that's going to wind up working out. So now they got to figure out what's the next move once they start, you know, there's a way to get through. There's a, a fan access on the roof that they figured out if they could pop the rivets out of was wide enough for them to get through. Then they'd be on the roof and they'd be in a blacked out spot uh, where the, the lights and the guard towers couldn't really see them, the spotlights and everything. So then they'd figure out a way to then scale down, I think, into the kitchen shaft. Is that no, right? They, they used a, a, a a vent pipe, I believe, from the kitchen to come down that was down on the outside of the wall. That Once they were up onto the roof, then they were able to come down off the building via this uh, pipe that was yeah, the, the scale to the down side. pipe. Yeah. yeah. It's so no longer ballsy. there. Is it? OK. Yeah, I didn't the know pipe that. is no longer there. That's interesting. They because um, now they did that. And now this is all going to lead toward eventually they have to figure out, well, we're free to move around on the island right now. 
because I mean, you've kind of pulled off the first amazing part of this feat just by getting beyond the wall. You're out of your cell. That's pretty impressive. Right. Now you're out of the property. Now you got to figure out how you're going to get off the island. So that's going to be the next part here. And uh, this leads us to the night of the escape, which is June 11th, 1962, where despite all their clever planning, the boys discovered that Alan West was not able to get through the hole in his cell vent opening anymore. So some say that there were, and this is where it gets really interesting because Alan yeah, West is, is a uh, character. Yeah. Where's, who's your reference here? Yeah, this is, uh, it becomes impossible to fact check this because it's bullshit upon bullshit that he may be spun in one different direction to get a different outcome. So it's hard to tell if Alan West is a, a brilliant guy, a bumbling idiot, uh, or what the deal or is. But all of the above? It, it's a little bit of everything. So uh, some people say that there was an additional bar that he found in the hole in the wall that he didn't count on, that he wasn't able to work around, right? Uh, other people say that the cement that he had used to replace the wall as it was uh, crumbling around him. So keep in mind, you're digging a hole in the bottom vent part here, but now there's cracks up above it. So he was trying to repair the other parts of the, the cement wall. Um, so what some people are saying is that he'd repaired it too well and now repaired the, the chunks of it that, you know, if, if you were even just trying to get it to look like it wasn't completely busted open, that now he actually technically built himself a new concrete wall to keep himself <laughs> in with. But um, Kind of like paint yourself into a corner. Yeah. Well, he, he cemented himself back into a cell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like that there's two comics on this show and you're the one that landed that line. <laughs> But uh, now, like we said here, it gets a little bit weird. The answers are hilarious to this because most of the info is going to come from West himself. Because remember, we said there's three people they're looking for to this day. After eventually getting up to their makeshift workshop where the boys intended to meet, West realized that they had left without him. So West crawled back down to his cell and went to sleep. Um, now, there's a, a little bit of conjecture up here as to whether or not they thought that uh, it should be, you know, it, it's all for one and one for all kind of a thing. Should we wait for West? Or was there like a, hey, we got to plan this thing because, you know, we know what time, how many hours we have left in the day. And we still got to find a way to get, uh, you know, a couple of miles into the shore at this point. Yeah, there's a lot of different theories as to why that. But and there's one that I'll throw at you towards the end here. But keep going. Oh, when he holds some to the end, folks, you know what we're nah, getting. Nah, right? gonna be right? good. And this one's bad. free, OK? And if you want, you can go ahead and support <laughs> the show over on Patreon where we're giving you three free episodes. This one included every month and at the end of the month on the final Tuesday. Uh, we do ask if you guys go ahead and just join up on our Patreon for three bucks a month. That's a, less than a dollar an episode when you really break it all down. And it helps us out with keeping the kahuna happy and earning Ming's love. So. Maybe he just wanted to stay because he loved the meatloaf. You That's know, they had the best food. <laughs> it's really. It's good food. That accordion player I hate is gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't quite finish reading that article in Popular Mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the answers to that become hilarious and uh, it's impossible to fact check. Because like we said, West is uh, coming up with all the information himself here. Um, but the boys are gone, right? But in West's later testimonies about the incident, he included info he only gave in order to be promised a lesser punishment. So he cooperated fully with the investigation. Now, West, who is considered to be a mindless thief compared to uh, Morris, who is you know, re legit legitimately a genius, um, he claimed to have organized the entire escape plan himself. West. West is taking it. He goes, oh, it was all my idea, really, guys. You know? Yeah, does it make sense, though, that the guy who masterminded it is the guy that was left behind? Well, I didn't know if it was going to work. You know, yeah. we'll see. Oops. <laughs> It's uh, it's always that great thing where it's like, oh, yeah, uh, anytime like a, a new comedian puts out a special, he always hears him be like, yeah, I just lost a bit to Bill Burr. Did you? I don't know that you did. <laughs> so, but um, anyway, uh, as we're moving forward here, he does get a lesser uh, punishment, by the way, West, for cooperating. And he's eventually transferred out of Alcatraz later uh, at his next uh, location is, I believe, is in Florida. He also murders another inmate in his next location. Uh, which could have been racially motivated, they said. It could have been like a straight-up hate crime uh, and would die of stomach issues just a few years later. Yeah, they moved him around a bunch of times. Uh, oh, yeah. He finally uh, died of uh, stomach cancer. Yeah, it was a change in the diet, man. He was eating all <laughs> organic up in Alcatraz. <laughs> Missing that meat Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, man, it'd be so great if it was uh, the Alcatraz food was uh, – we have vegan options here. <laughs> San Fran afterwards, folks. <laughs> But hey, rice aroni, that's San Francisco <laughs> treat. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a uh, cruelty free beatings here at this prison. But the prison staff at Alcatraz, they didn't really keep great inventory on their available raincoat supply on the island because it's a rainy locale out there, from what I understand. And um, it'd be funny though, because if they did keep a better inventory on these things, they might have noticed that at least 35 of them had gone missing. 
All right. 35 at anything. You'll figure it out. Like uh, Ming figures out when I take um, uh, Death Wish coffee out of here all the time, <laughs> probably because all the cameras he has pointing at me. But um, no, if I had 35 of them that I took one time, Ming would figure it out. Right. Uh, even though it doesn't take an accurate inventory of them, as I've proven. But um, 35 raincoats go missing. They were carefully acquired and painstakingly sewn together, then plied with glue from the prison workshop by Morris and the Anglin brothers. They made the raincoats into life rafts and homemade life vests from an article they had found. In Popular Mechanics. Was it the pop Popular Mechanics? I had read somebody said that it was Sports Illustrated. Yeah, it was Popular Mechanics. It was How to Enjoy Water Sports on a Budget or something like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> really stretch your prison-breaking yeah. dollar here, folks. No place in Chinatown you get water sports for free. <laughs> Uh, Max is coming for the title, baby. <laughs> and those uh, raincoats, too. Uh, there was a lot of the raincoats were given to them by other inmates kind of a thing. So they mm -hmm. collect, either they stole them or they uh, were given to them. So like you said before, it's all, all for the team here that if we can get some of these guys out of here, um, it's a victory for the entire uh, prison population. Morris is planning something. And then, you know, if he gets out, then he's going to need someone to open for him on the road. So that's, I mean, <laughs> hang on, I think I'm confusing businesses again. <laughs> but after scaling the wall, descending down a kitchen vent, hey, you were right, Max, and then climbing a barbed wire fence into the blind spot to the guard towers, Morris and the Anglins launched their raft and supposedly headed towards Angel Island, two miles north of Alcatraz. Now, this might have been intended as a misdirect, though. More on that here in a second. Um, so the best way to throw off the people, you know, eventually they're going to notice you're gone, right? Your, your fake head in a bed is not going to you know, last yeah. forever. <laughs> by, the, by the light of day. Uh, yeah. Oh, your shit. cardboard vents, they're going to figure out where you went. So the best thing to do is to then throw off their initial effort to catch you. So this is a great move here in terms of a misdirect, if that's what they did. Um, the next morning with Alan West now sleeping back in his cell, the guards finally caught wise to the sleeping dummy head routine of Morris and the Anglins. Uh, rumors were that up to 80 other inmates knew of the planned escape and kept things hush, even when loud noises were heard during the night as the men supposedly scaled the air shaft walls. So imagine how it's like Christmas morning kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Like, oh, is that Santa Claus on the roof? Is that Frank Morris escaping in the middle of the night? So a, uh, this was crazy here. It's going to be a massive land, sea, and air hunt for the missing convicts. And over the course of a 10-day search, the following evidence was found. A paddle floating alone off the shore of Angel Island. That same day, in a very similar location, a plastic bag uh, contained a uh, covered wallet was also found. Inside the wallet was names and addresses of friends and family members of the Anglin brothers. All right. A couple of days later, shredded pieces of raincoat thought to possibly be the remnants of the raft were also found. This was found closer over towards the Golden Gate Bridge as was later a homemade life jacket of the same material. So there's some evidence here. You know, it's not what you'd call hard evidence, but there's, you know, you can spin that together. So um, the FBI started out their investigation with the premise that the three men had drowned, but no bodies were ever found. That would be your true hard evidence when we find the bodies. I'd say so. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I would tell the I tale. deduce you're right. <laughs> <laughs> By dental records or something, yeah. anyhow, right? Well, this is curious, too, because uh, San Francisco is infamous for its high suicide rate and the use of the Golden Gate Bridge uh, is renowned for uh, floating bodies wind up washing ashore. There's that horrifying uh, documentary, The Bridge or something. You ever see that? Yeah, I have. It's uh, terrifying. Yeah, man. They interviewed the one guy who survived it. Yes. It's uh, <laughs> can't even commit his own suicide. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's a, what a loser. What a loser. Huh? told me I was no good. <laughs> But yeah, that's a, a true story. Uh, my buddy Chris Buck has a great joke about that too when he talks about um, a lot of the people will go out, they'll do, it's suicide tourism. The people will go to San Francisco to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and a lot of times they have to rent a car. So at the either end of the bridge, they'll just be rented cars just sitting there, you know, with like Missouri license. And uh, yeah, if, you if you're local over there and you're just trying to like get a bike ride in or something like that, there's a big party that has to see the suicide, you know, cars rented there just go... Fucking tourists. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's the great Chris Buck, uh, for those who uh, want to follow him. He's a giant mess. He might not be here much longer. Um, <laughs> but again, the FBI started out this investigation that uh, these men had drowned, but you haven't found any bodies here yet. And uh, it's very curious because even the local cops are saying, well, listen, most bodies do wind up washing ashore. We do find something eventually. Right. So this is a little peculiar. 
Um, but none of the three men's bodies ever did. A Norwegian ship claimed to have spotted a dead body floating near the Golden Gate Bridge about a month after the incident, but they didn't report it until months later. The conclusion then was that it, uh, the body belonged to a local baker that had recently committed suicide. It was extremely unlikely that a dead body was going to float for more than the month that it would have taken for it to be either one of the Anglin brothers or Morris. So this leads us to the fun part, Max. It's conspiracy time, buddy. Yes. So <laughs> That's why I'm here. I'm excited. <laughs> Put on your tinfoil hat, folks. We got some weird shit for you. Uh, the FBI concluded that the men likely drowned or succumbed to hypothermia and that the rough tides of the water uh, probably either dragged them down or washed them out to sea. However, aside from the items mentioned above, no other hard evidence has appeared. So due to the over-the-top maintenance costs, because uh, what was it? I, I believe the average prison was... Uh, $3 was, per day per inmate. And at Alcatraz, it was $10 right. per inmate. More than three times the, yeah. the cost. Gentrification. Because, yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you. Everything had to uh, be uh, shipped in. I mean, you're on an island. That and they're feeding a, them so well. Right. You yeah. know, it's, <laughs> it's insane. That's right. Uh, but it's uh, it's a strange uh, thing here. But due to those uh, rising over the top maintenance costs, Alcatraz is actually going to get closed as a prison by Lawrence Patrick. Oh, actually, yeah, I'll tell you what. I'm going to throw this one to Max. He just gave me that <gasps> that he's excited and he knew it. Fucking run with it, buddy. Old Bobby Kennedy. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You don't want to uh, know what I pay ten dollars a day for. <laughs> after so many years, too, that the uh, the salt water environment. Um, the Alcatraz is, is starting to uh, disintegrate. Yes. I mean, if you can dig your way through Literally. a concrete wall with a spoon that you got out of the out of the uh, mess hall, yeah, I'd say it's there's time a, to there's shut a problem. Down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're harboring, you know, the right. uh, greatest escape artists in the country, and you're putting them all in one place. Oof. Right. I didn't even think of that too. That that it like an, a smaller, less um, a more uh, uh, passive prison population maybe that wouldn't have been an issue but you did right. max is right you did just put a team together whether you want to admit it or yeah. not these guys just got out at least they never found the bodies and hey maybe i can give that a shot too and yeah. have, there were other attempts after go ahead no no no, no, no you I, know the guy i'm excited i don't remember his name but uh another inmate's going to attempt to uh, uh escape as well and what he does he takes um uh rubber gloves and actually tapes them together and inflates them himself and turns them into like uh what, what do they call it for a little kid like muscle uh, little flippers yeah like the the um i'm trying to not flippers but it was uh yeah Wings. little um uh yeah the, the, my grandpa used to call them muscles. swimmies muscles uh, yeah. that's adorable yeah. <laughs> swimmies swimmies yep. putting on your swimmies or whatever yeah. and just paddling his way out but anyway this guy winds up getting to the shore so he proved that you could make that swim which is what a lot of people are saying there's no way you could ever make this swim he's proven that you can and then even crazier is that local kids found him. So he was suffering from hypothermia, was absolutely exhausted. Right. So after like he recovered in a hospital and then where'd they send him? Right back to Alcatraz. Right back to Alcatraz. Back to Alcatraz. Alcatraz. Yeah, that's quite yeah. a it's good cardio, buddy. Good back cardio. To, I did a little research. On, Tuesday. I did a little research <laughs> on that too. In in uh, the month of June in San Francisco, the water temperature in and around uh, Alcatraz is somewhere in the middle 50s. And that whole hypothermia kind of a thing uh, they're saying that you could probably uh, succumb to exhaustion in one to two hours and your survival is like one to six. So cause, again, you're swimming, but it's not just a straight out uh, mile swim or two mile swim. You're fighting the currents and everything else. So yeah, this guy nearly, so nearly around. died. He yes. did make it to shore, but he nearly died doing it. So um, it's possible, but that's it, about it is it. possible. Now, these guys, uh, Morris and the Anglin brothers, they were a little bit older, but they were in good shape. Um, they were also uh, they did have the raft. So the matter of it, uh, that's another thing too. where right. Um, did the raft pop while they were out there? It's a homemade raft. Uh, you're dealing with some pretty rough ties or did they then have to swim after not expecting to have to swim? There's a lot of more. Yeah, there's some not, weird stuff going on here. There was another theory, too, that they never uh, took the raft from the island directly over to the two mile away to the next island that what they did with the raft is go around alcatraz island to where the the ferry boat would come in mm -hmm. and they actually were towed back to shore um in at night off of a, a very long extension cord that was reported missing so that they uh, they, so they they towed their their way back using the the ferry that was i think left at like one o'clock in the morning kind of a thing so it's dark it's it's at night and it's another theory that 
you know, they never went from Alcatraz directly to the mainland. They were they were towed by the ferry that came back and forth. Also, did they want to make it seem like they were going to Angel Island so they could throw everybody off by going straight into the mainland? Right. And see, I, uh, I did a lot of research for this. I watched a Mythbusters episode <laughs> from 2003 there that my go. buddy Chris Schwalje sent to me. And uh, I was going to bring it up too, dude. Yeah. I'm glad, you was, I'm glad it was you. Yeah. So what they theorized, that they did the test pretty much. They made the raft and everything and they had the two guys i don't even know their names the one with the silly facial hair and the other guy and another guy they all got in this raft that they made yes and they fashioned it out of raincoats and things like that and they did it in the middle of the night and it took them out to the northern side of the golden gate bridge to marin oh, highlands shit. so what they think was frank was smart enough to where he knew the tides like they said that when they did the pre uh they like did a recreation of the water and the tides like through some special effects company and to get to angel island it was like impossible every time they tried it it would not go up there when they floated out the uh the no little shit. raft so they said more than like most likely what would have happened was frank knew this he knew that they wouldn't be able to travel north two miles nah. so what they did was they went out and then over to the northern side of the golden gate bridge to the marin highlands and escaped through there see now this this is where it gets really fucking fun too because uh and this one i was excited about it i finished writing this in the the camera tower today while i was at mama the racetrack but um phone tips and anonymous sightings of Morris and the Anglins will continue for years after the escape. So they're the only guys that ever potentially got away with it. Everybody else who ever tried to escape was either captured and returned or died in the process and they could prove it. So Alcatraz is closed now. These guys are out. That, that, there's still no evidence, no proven uh, anything in any which way. Now, some reports indicate that Morris and the Anglins have survived and there were repeated reports that someone who looked exactly like Clarence was living in Brazil. One other theory involves, this one was my favorite because it's a future loser reception because we're going to wind up covering this guy. Uh, Coons or Max, do you guys know uh, who the uh, the infamous Bumpy Johnson is off the top of your head? The drug dealer? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're familiar. I'm familiar. Bumpy Johnson, not a character played by Chappelle on Chappelle's show as much as it would be great if it was Ashy Larry and Bumpy Johnson <laughs> hanging out with one another. <laughs> Shout out Donnell Rawlings. Um, but uh, no, Bumpy Johnson and uh, his friendship of sorts with uh, Mr. Frank Morris, the two of them were friends. So uh, it's entirely possible that with Bumpy's international connections via his, uh, as Max mentioned, his drug dealing business, because Bumpy Johnson, he was working for Frank Lucas. He's in the movie American Gangster as well. Um, so he's hooked up with this whole crazy heroin business. Uh, that's an international business, right, Dad? Yeah, they got the ways of going from here to there. They got some import-export going on, right? Maybe there's Absolutely. a chance that potentially a ship could come out to San Francisco Bay and meet Frank Morris because he's good friends you know, with Bumpy Johnson to the point where Bumpy's going to pull a couple connections for him. If these crazy white boys are going to go out there floating, I'll find a way to get them out. That's <laughs> So can always use an intelligent guy on your team, right? It's the truth, man. That's why, thank God, it was uh, Frank Morris planning this and not Alan West. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to uh, build upon your theory, Max, too, that it could be that West was left behind purposely yeah. to tell them that they were going to go to Angel Island when all along they were going <laughs> in the completely opposite direction. I mean, I can't even imagine being like, you know, I'm going to brave going into these crazy ripping waters around Alcatraz to escape. I mean, I'd have a hard enough time driving in the rain at this age. You know? And I'm in the same age range as these guys. I can't imagine just being like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Right. And like the high IQ of Frank Morris had to play into finding people, I would say, dumb enough to want to, you know, do this brave task. Well, the Anglin brothers too. It, do you remember there was a while back that there was a uh... – um, there's always, I forget what it was, but it was a viral image of a, a good looking inmate. Um, yes. If people looked at the Anglin brothers, I can't remember, if it, I think it's John uh, Anglin, that people were looking at it and there's like, like, ooh, that's a handsome man right there. So it's, yeah, he's escaped from Alcatraz. Yeah, but he's like really good looking. <laughs> no, but he's on the loose and considered, uh, I know, but like, I just feel like I could change him. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, so there's the idea that Bumpy Johnson might have gotten involved, too, because I couldn't prove this or not prove it because it's mentioned in the movie. But I think the movie plays with the timeline that supposedly a letter arrived 
uh, for Bumpy Johnson at Alcatraz a, l- a little while after the escape happened that is supposedly from Frank Morris, and it just read Gone Fishing. So that was like the little tip of the hat kind of a thing, like, hey, you got, you know, we made it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, interestingly enough, uh, South America, Dad, that's a part of the uh, the world where a lot of drugs come from, right? Could be. Yeah. It, ha- so, it has uh, that that uh, bad reputation, if you will. So now all of a sudden, these guys are possibly winding up down there. Uh, this is how wild it gets. In 1967, a man claiming to be a friend of Morris's from his school days reportedly bumped into him in Maryland. He refused to say anything else other than that uh, Morris was rocking a goatee. So kind of like Max has this fierce mustache right now to throw everybody off. Yeah, you don't know <laughs> that, right. Max. Max escaped from California, Kahuna, all right? And he's here. <laughs> That's right. But uh, another one here, the Anglin family members uh, would all regularly be able – and they, they proved a lot of this too. They showed hard copies of it and a lot of the handwriting matched. Um, the Anglin family members would receive Christmas cards from Brazil regularly along with other packages and stuff. And their mother, Mama Anglin here, got flowers and a card signed, Love the Two, every Mother's Day until her death in 1973. It's my favorite part of the entire story now, Dad. All right? <laughs> this is my favorite part of the whole story. Mine too. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. We couldn't write this. An yeah. entire writer's room of comics would not come up with something as good as the idea that at Mama Anglin's funeral, two large, strange-looking women arrived at the funeral, stood in the back, very, very large, very, very weirdly dressed. A lot of makeup. Heavy-duty <laughs> makeup. Right. Big, you know, maybe weird-looking hair, possibly a wig, maybe. Are reported at her funeral. They speak to no one, pay their respects, and leave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got the Kahuna jaw dropped. A legit one this now, time too. Don't, don't be a transgender phobe now. Okay? That uh, could be this. Just it was a friend, of, an old friend of a mama Anglican. Yeah, that's well, it's California, so <laughs> I'm just teasing. But now this would have been because uh, the, the Anglin boys from the Florida, Georgia, Alabama area. They always kind of bounced around over there. So that one's pretty great. Now. uh the same incident will occur at the death of their father in 1989, when two men arrived with uh, very, very large beards, like ZZ Top looking beards, and paid their respects directly at the funeral home uh, and then vanished, never to be seen again. So a couple of years after that, an anonymous source named Kathy, uh, more like a Karen when you hear what she did, uh, gave some proof that Clarence may have been living in Mariana, Florida. Now, I've been down to Mariana, Florida. It's... It's a weird part of Florida, man. You're talking panhandle area. It's not sure if it's Alabama or if it's Florida. It's a, a particular type of people back there. It's nice, some good people, some backwoods stuff over there. And uh, definitely a place where you don't want to be going around the backwoods if you don't know your way around at night. So after uh, this woman, Kathy, correctly describes the eye color, height, and other physical traits of uh, Clarence uh, Anglin correctly, agents were actually dispatched to look in the backwoods area for the escapee. Now, when the people, the agents that are there, they start showing other locals. Uh, here's a picture of what we think Frank Morris would look like today. Uh, a local man claiming goes, "Well, oh, I've seen a man looks just like that. He was kind of near where I just saw that other Anglin fellow you're looking for." So, do the Anglin brothers and Frank Morris are they all living in Mariana, Florida, right now? Is that possible? Did they disappear down to Brazil or whatever? Because that's the craziest one. Facial recognition software shows the very likelihood of a, a match to a photo taken in the 1980s that is thought to be authentic, showing the Anglin brothers living in South America with big sunglasses on. They grew their hair out. They got like handlebar. They're all looking like little Pablo Escobars over there <laughs> now. But now I read that that was actually proven to be, uh, most of it was a facial recognition match, Dad. You had something else on that? No, it was just uh, inconclusive that, you know, because they were wearing sunglasses, it was really hard to determine if it was definite or not. But, you know, it, 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 it's possible. And also, it's not possible. So. <laughs> I mean, I think NBC needs to green light that sitcom. That would How be do you not? tremendous. <laughs> <It's-> <laughs> you know, just the three of them, they escape prison. Now they got to dress up uh, as ladies and go to their parents' funerals. And I would imagine the Anglins, after their father died, were just like, oh, thank God we don't have to go to any more of these. <laughs> Get out of these women's clothes. It's bosom buddies meet six feet under. Um, <laughs> so even better here. Uh, as because Kahuna, when did this happen? If you don't have to remember the exact, but it was 1962, 1962, right? When the incident we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, until 2030, this uh, uh, warrant is still active by the U.S. Marshal Services. As recently, I'll tell you what. When do you think is the most recent information that they've gotten about this case? Like 
like to like warrant looking into the fo- like re looking at the whole case. Yeah, or yeah. Just in ge- like a general thing. I would say any hot leads. Probably the late eighties. Two thousand thirteen. When you and me were on this planet, sir, all right? Because I just graduated high school. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I had just fucked up my marriage. Um, <laughs> Uh, as of 2013, a letter was received by the San Francisco Police Department claiming to be an aging and ill John Anglin. John states in the letter that he, his brother, and Frank Morris all survived their escape attempt, but just barely. So he also admits that uh, Frank has passed away in 2005 and that Clarence died in 2008. He admitting to having cancer and offered himself up to the San Francisco Police Department agreeing to one year of jail time in exchange for medical treatment. All right. So he goes, I'll come back. I'll serve one year of jail time, but I need you guys to help me out here. I'm, I'm yeah, not doing well. He's looking for the free medical. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, just go to Canada, dude. It's, <laughs> but uh, if he could receive that medical treatment, he would have turned himself over. Now, when the document was tested for handwriting and other forensic details, those results also came back as inconclusive. Now, they did send a couple of people that know what they didn't follow up with it. The FBI didn't because uh, they got turned over to the FBI. They didn't make any sort of move on it or anything like that. Because, again, we're talking about how many people were pranksters and stuff like that here. Now, it's funny to because make a prank about something that happened in the 60s in 2013. It's very specific. But yeah. there's a little bit of a, a you know how yeah. we're all getting excited for these guys. We're exci- we, we want these guys to have pulled this off. That was what yeah. was happening in the zeitgeist as well. And the opposite of that. Th- are the feds willing to admit that yeah. these guys were successful and they did get away from the rock? You know? Nothing to see here, folks. Everything's yeah. handled. We got them. We got them. So, and it is the FBI we talked about too, man. Where it was uh, Hoover was such a bastard about some of the moves that he made uh, that it got to the point where you hated him, even though he was on the side of truth and justice in the American way. Indeed. Yeah. Now, uh, another then, man who dressed up as a woman that's, <laughs> ties it all in. They said that uh, we actually proved that that was, for, if, as far as we can gather, that that was done as a smear job against him because he was such a square. Like he lived with yeah. his, uh, I mean, I think he never really got in any relationships. He lived alone with his mother and stuff like So they, a lot of the stuff that they did was to pick apart his character because he had dirt on everybody. Yeah. I mean, imagine being J. Edgar Hoover, dad, and sitting there, and this will tie in loosely to what you're about to say, but, um, you have a sex tape of a German spy who's a good looking German spy or whatever. And uh, you are suspecting her of being in cahoots with Hitler, if you will. And it's World War II time frame. And she keeps hooking up with this handsome young naval officer in Washington, D.C. And then finally, the war's over. Hitler's killed. And now you no longer really need this sex tape that you have anymore. But hey, let's look at that again, the sex tape. Now this woman, she's back over there in Germany now. She's proven to just be a journalist. Is that John F. Kennedy fucking her in this video? <laughs> oh, I have a sex tape of the current president. Yeah, hey, we'll, we'll keep that in a special file. Yeah, hey, uh, Jimmy, why don't you come over here, buddy? And I'll let you know a couple of things. This is how it's going to work now for the next couple of years <laughs> when we got to work with one another. So that was good old J. Edgar, man. Um now, he's also still a little bit loosely involved with this story, too, because the FBI closed their investigations. We said the Marshal Services did not. Lawrence Patrick, anything you want to send us home with? Well, no, just that um, during its 29 years of operation, uh, the penitentiary kept claiming that no prisoner successfully escaped. So, I mean, this, you know, who hey, do you, who, who do you want to believe? Well, <laughs> yeah. Are you going to say that, yeah, that that uh, letter that they received looking for, uh, you know, free medical for one year? that, you know, were they successful? And now the guy's trying to come back in. But uh, in their 29-year history, a total of 36 prisoners made 14 escape attempts, two men trying twice. So there's a two-time loser right there. (laughs) 23 were caught alive, six were shot and killed during their escape, and two drowned. And five were listed as missing and presumed drowned. Um, So, I mean, you know, who are you going to believe? Is it a, is it a, federal conspiracy that uh, these guys never did escape or is it uh, that's all bullshit and they do realize that they escaped and uh, they were living their happy days in Brazil someplace. Which just leads us to what we've known all along. Move to South America, everyone. <laughs> hey, okay. Right. I but found something kind of cool about Alcatraz. Hit me because I want to throw to you for a, a casting couch in a second too for a reboot. Okay, because mine's very specific, but I, I'll tell you. But when I was looking it up, just more information about Alcatraz because I was curious what they did with the building after it closed in the 60s. In the 70s, there was actually an occupation yes. of Alcatraz. The American the last, Indian Movement. The yes. American yeah. Indian Movement. But um, 
one of the biggest supporters who was also on the island was Grace Thorpe. Keep who, going. Who was Jim Thorpe's daughter. Ah, no shit. Loserception yeah. on the back. That's... People ask, why do we pay for an engineer? <laughs> there it it's is. It's because we don't it know is. how to do any of this stuff, but also because he does shit like that, folks. She was one of the occupiers and helped convince celebrities to help with the movement. So, no like, shit. She, she convinced... Um, well, what the fuck was it? Where is it? Where is it? I, she convinced some actor to donate a generator, uh, an ambulance, and a boat. Like she was, she was that convincing. Yeah, it's not. I admit, there's worse things. Yeah, I did not know that about the Grace Thorpe thing. That's pretty great. The um, obviously, I want to check out Alcatraz. Um, I've been told my comedy wouldn't work in San Francisco by a couple of people, but um, <laughs> we'll figure it out anyway. Um, Max, anything you want to say to the people at home? Uh, yeah, keep downloading American Loser. It's one of my favorite podcasts. I like KP it. is very funny. Go see him around uh, in New York, New Jersey, well, all over back. the country. We're going to figure out some stuff to want to do together. So that's going to happen. A fork on conclusion. The American Loser Tour <laughs> featuring LP and Kahuna. I did have someone <laughs> ask me uh, why um, Kahuna wasn't at my show. Oh, Kahuna's not here tonight? And I was like, no, no, we just do the podcast together. It's like, you know, like, oh, I thought like he was gonna, you know, like, all right, fine. I get I it. I can't have more people knowing what I look like. You're getting neuralized as soon as you walk out the door. <laughs> <laughs> Those who need to know, Kahuna is a uh, four foot seven Italian boy from Newark, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> and by the way, I do believe they escaped. Totally. Yeah. 100%. Totally. Yeah. Uh, it, I it's, believe they escaped 100%. and they lived for sure. I personally subscribe to the theory that Bumpy Johnson got involved and got him hooked up and taken down south because uh, it, it's too good of a story. Man. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, actually, they described Frank Moore as an intelligent guy. Um, he was about, uh, what, 6'2", uh, good with his hands, good IQ, uh, commanding presence, did a podcast with his son. Um <laughs> and you want to admit to dad no no you spent no, a little no. time out west in the 60s I deny, 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 deny. <laughs> max one more time where can the people find you over on twitter uh, and stuff at max antonucci on instagram and twitter and max is your friend.com is my website please go there for dates i'll be <laughs> adding some soon hell yeah dude and uh cahoons the original movie escape from alcatraz that was made uh is starring possibly my favorite all-time actor clint eastwood as frank morris all right uh, also in there is, uh, I think Fred Ward is in there. Um, okay. So he winds up playing uh, one of the Anglin brothers. And there's a couple other good people in there too, man. It's uh, who played um, who played Bumpy Johnson or the guy based off Bumpy Johnson. I can't remember that one off the top of my head. But if you had to do a reboot of this movie now, and it's it really is a classic and it holds up, okay. and it is highly realistic, by the way. Okay, I wouldn't do – so here's my thing. I wouldn't even do like a remake of that film. I would do something a little bit more original. But to st- to start with my statement, because my choice is puppets. Well, yeah, it's gonna be the mu- it's the Muppets Escape from Alcatraz. Oh, I love I'm, this. I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, I actually no. would love that. So I want this movie to start off. I want it directed by Guy Ritchie, but I want it. I want an early two thousands act like a crime comedy type of movie. So via Snatch, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Yeah. So I want. Ryan Reynolds and Ryan Gosling as the the brothers. The Anglin brothers, okay. Tim Blake Nelson as Alan West. Tim Blake Nelson from uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, if you need to remember, that's his face. Because when you were describing... Oh, oh man, that is perfect. And then for... Uh, for Morris, I was thinking David Harbour, who's currently Hopper on Stranger Things. I was like, oh, this could this could kind of work but this would have to be kind of back this would have to be kind of done in early 2000s because they're all past the ages that was kind of the struggle where i was like who would i do this with but that's who's <laughs> that's the pick that's my pick for the cast of this movie it would be a comedy for sure because i find this whole si- this whole situation fucking hilarious oh, dude, <laughs> this it's whole great. escape is like and the fa- they survived. I don't give a, I don't yeah, give a crap what sure. anyone yeah. says. They survived. I think everyone in this room is going to agree. <laughs> yeah, These guys, absolutely. they pulled it off. <laughs> they pulled it off. Just the government's too salty to admit it. <laughs> it's. Uh, I'll say this one too, because uh, this was very, very fun to do. We got a couple other. In doing the research for this, we always discover new wormholes we're going to wind up going down. We got a really, really great one. Uh, Max mentioned it earlier. It's his favorite conspiracy ever that he always goes back to. We're doing that next week. We actually have a legit law enforcement person who's going to come oh, in and talk to me about man, it. Oh, man. I I'm, can't wait. I'm excited. If I didn't realize it was your favorite, I would have brought you on for that one. But um, 
I will say this, though, you guys who are the listeners to the show, you're the reason that this thing continues to exist. The great people over at uh, Patreon, the founding losers, you guys are the reasons why I can continue to afford to do this show. As long as I'm not, it's not about turning a profit. It's about covering my losses. As long as we do that, I'm having a good enough time here with you guys. Let's keep this party rolling. So there are two options if you want to support us over on Patreon. You can join up and be a five dollar member month, uh, five dollar a month member. Sorry about that. A little word vomit there for you. But um for the five bucks, you get to vote on future upcoming topics. You also get merch sent to you directly by us anytime we get some cool new stickers and patches and stuff like that made up. Uh, also, keep in touch with me. Talk to me regularly over on the, the Facebook and the Instagram and everything as well. The other option is a $3 uh, Patreon member that just gets you the bare minimum, which is the uh, episode, the, the bonus episode. So every Tuesday, uh, you'll get a free episode on the first, second, and third Tuesday of the month. And that see you last Tuesday, all right, if you see what I'm doing over there. Um, that's the one where if you're not a member of the Patreon, we can't give you something for free, all right? So go ahead and support us a little bit, man. If you wind up breaking it down by joining the $3 a month tier, it's less than a dollar an episode, and we're giving you four bangers every month, all right? So please check that out here. Check out Max Antonucci. Support the kahuna. Keep his identity a secret, all right? Only he can know. It's very important. It's another uh, government conspiracy. Another, con yeah, the tinfoil hat man himself. But uh, yeah, kahuna's actually Alex Jones, guys. It's been <laughs> him the entire time. <laughs> He has the I've documents. Been trying, I've been trying to convince y'all that they're turning the frogs gay since the beginning. <laughs> Come on, man. But uh, Lawrence, Patrick, anything to say to the people no, at home? That's it. Pretty much. This is a damn good one, man. So, uh, And also, it is Memorial Day, so we want to go ahead and say thank you to uh, especially all the veterans listening to the show. I do get Absolutely. a lot of people reaching out to me. Uh, in fact, uh, one of them I'll give a shout out to real quickly if I can. Uh, he reached out to me the other day, and uh, we were talking a little bit because he is a regular listener to American Loser. And then on top of that, he also was stationed out uh, near Deadwood territory. So he really enjoyed the Doc Holiday stuff that we did. But the gentleman's man is uh, Jeff Quinton. So, Jeff, thank you so much for reaching out to us. And we'll keep something together here. We'll figure it all out as we go. But, guys, the question is this. Did the Anglets and Frank Morris make it out alive? Was Bumpy Johnson involved? The world may never know the true ending to the story of Escape from Alcatraz. But that's why they're American losers. An American loser the day I was born. American loser the day I was born An American loser the day I was born